is a second loneliness, you could call it that way. And maybe it is precisely the fact that you have found a home and feel deeply loved, there is still a hole when you have found a home. Pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together. We have to understand that we're not each other's enemy. We have to say, let's move forward. It can feel daunting to not be perfect when you've got all these like perfect people. People aren't perfect, no one's perfect. It's good to see you here. Um, I was a little bit worried that uh, no one would show up on a beautiful sunny weekend, long weekend. It's good to see that you're here. Um, because when I, when I prepare for any sort of message or speech or important job interview, I always end up visualising myself doing what I'm going to say, you know, say what I'm going to say, how I'm going to say it, and importantly, who I'm going to say it to. Um, so a couple of weeks, I was already up here on stage in my mind, thinking about the sorts of people I'd be talking to. And um, I had a really amazing revelation. There were certain faces that stood out from the crowd. Um, I thought of a guy called Paul, who usually sits down here. I've known Paul since I was about this big, and he used to teach me Sunday school at the hall um, when we were down the road. And I've had the privilege of knowing, knowing uh, Paul's family for years and years. And he has told me so many stories over his life about his faith, um, his testimony. And I realized that these little stories from time to time really shaped me and encouraged me. Um, and then I thought of a guy called Avon who usually sits over there. I've only had about three or four conversations with Avon, but every time I talk to him, I walk away thinking, man, there's something cool about that guy, and I really, really want to be like him when I'm older. And then I thought of other people who I've had dinners with over the last few weeks. Um, I've mowed lawns with. Um, I've had career advice from. And I thought, these sorts of people are the small voices in my life that have shaped me. And they're not like these letters up here. They're not big and loud. They're not famous. They haven't written books, but they've been faithful and the small day-to-day -day things in their life. And it's these small voices that have really encouraged and shaped me over my life. And I thought, this is why we turn up to church. This is why we get involved. This is why we sign up for Guess Who dinners. This is why um, we just uh, sit somewhere new every, every Sunday. Not so that we can get free career advice or get our lawns mowed, but so that we can use our stories and our talents and our abilities to bless others. And if that's the only thing that you remember during the sermon, then I'm happy. You can get back to Facebook or, or uh, go and have a coffee now. But if you want to stay, I am going to be talking about a famous book-writing man. I am going to be talking about Henry Nouwen. Who knows Henry Nouwen? Who's heard of him before? Yeah, he's been mentioned at a few sermons uh, here on a Sunday morning. He, um, he's quite famous. He's written heaps of books. He's been quoted by politicians. He's a theo theologian. He's a psychologist. And there's even websites dedicated to him. And that's when you know that you've really made it in the world, when there's a website dedicated to you. So who was he? Well, he was born in 1963, uh, no, sorry, 1932 in Holland, and when he left school, he studied to become a Catholic priest. And during this time, he developed a real desire to study psychology and to marry the fields of theology with psychology. Now, psychology was quite a new field at the time. And so after he became ordained as a Catholic priest, he left and studied again for six years to graduate as a psychologist. He became an expert in psychology and theology and eventually uh, got his do doctorate in theology. He spoke, um, so he had teaching positions at very prestigious universities around the world, including Notre Dame, Yale, and Harvard. And after a very successful career teaching at all these universities, 
he ended up in a very curious place, the Larche community in Toronto. Now, the Larche community, it's a French word, I don't know what it means, um, is a community of, a global community of homes that care for the handicapped and the mentally incapable. And he spent 10 years there, and he was assigned a man called Adam. Now, Adam could not speak, he could not have control over his body, and he had seizures from time to time. So now, and here is this guy who is famous around the world for teaching for academia, and he spends two hours every morning dressing this man, combing his hair, showering him, and brushing his teeth. And now and spent 10 years in this community before dying in 1996. So who was Henry Nouwen? Was he a psychologist, a theologian, a successful academic, or a caregiver? Well, I think if Nouwen was at the front row this morning and I asked him to introduce himself, I don't think he would talk about the prestigious universities. I don't think he would talk about the fact that he has been quoted by politicians around the world. I don't think he would even care that there's a website dedicated to him. I think he would come up these stairs and walk along the stage and in one sentence say, I am a beloved son of God. And this statement represents a core theme of Nauman's work. If you were to read his books or listen to his sermons, you will see the statement. This is a statement of his identity and a central theme of his work, and is, and is an answer to a very important that we might, question that we must ask ourselves. Who are we, and where does our value come from? You see, Henry talks a lot in his books about wrestling between two voices. The first voice, which tells him to go into the world and to prove himself, to achieve great things, and to prove to yourself and to everyone else that you can be great. You can achieve big things. You don't need anyone else. You are who you achieve, what you achieve. And then there's a second voice, a voice that tells him that he is the beloved son of God. And I think we can all relate to now on, because you and I wrestle with these voices every day. When we go out these doors into the world, there are voices that tell us you are what you create, what you produce, how much power you have, what you look like. And then there is an inner voice, another voice, a voice that we find in the Bible that tells us to rest in the knowledge that we are the beloved children of God. So we have that choice in our lives. So how do we know which voice we are listening to? Well, I want to ask you a question. I was asked this question in January this year. It was a hot, stuffy room. Uh, There was about 150 other people with me. And this question was asked of me that stood out among everything else that was said that morning. And I want to ask you this question. What are you jealous of? Now, it's not a question designed to make you feel guilty or to feel, feel stink about yourself. I'm not into spiritual abuse. But I want to give you 15 seconds to think about it. What makes you jealous? When were you last jealous? Was it a good thing or was it a bad thing? Or was it neither? 15 seconds, starting now. This question is what's called an empowering question. It's designed to reveal something about yourself. And this question here reveals something specific about us. It reveals what we value in our identity. You see, what we desire and what we are jealous of is what we value. You don't value something that you don't want. I don't value or don't get jealous of my wife's hair straightener or blow dryer. Do I? I get jealous of the surfboard in the shop because that's what I value. But the thing is, what we value tends to define us, doesn't it? Let me explain. When this question was asked of me, some names came into my head. I thought of a guy called Mitch. Now, I've been surfing with Mitch only about twice, but I remember both times 
surfing with Mitch and admiring how good he was at surfing. And I remember feeling so jealous that I wasn't as good at surfing as him. And uh, I do this from time to time when I'm surfing. And I'm out there and I see all these other guys surfing and I, I end up hating surfing because I just feel so stink about myself. You see, I put value in sporting abilities and therefore I tend to define myself by my sporting abilities. I'll give you another example. When this question is asked, I think of a guy called Josh. Now, Josh was my best friend at school when we were about this big. And I bumped into him the other day after not seeing him for about 10 years. And I said, oh, what are you up to? And he said, oh, I, um, I own and run my own business doing blah, 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 blah. And instantly I thought, man, owning and running a business is so much cooler than being a lawyer. Man. And you see, I compared myself with what he had achieved in those 10 years versus what I had achieved in those 10 years. You see, I value achievements, and so I value myself by what I have or have not achieved. And as I sat in that hot, uh, stuffy conference room watching all these thoughts go through my mind, I realized that I tended to listen to that first voice that now one refers to, the voice that says, go prove yourself. You are valued by your abilities and your achievements. And I realize that I can go through life comparing myself and finding myself valued by how my abilities compare to others or how my achievements compare to others. And most of us do this, right? We compare. Just, uh, just yesterday morning, my wife was reading this article in the Canvas magazine, which is in the Herald, and the first article is on this. And this lady is writing about the fact that we compare the rich and the poor and who's above us and who's below. And she says, when we compare what we have, most of us not look to the family sleeping in their car, but to our neighbor who's putting in a pool in time for next summer. So rather than feeling grateful, we are left feeling bitter. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's in the papers and it's all around us. The fact that we are tempted to put our worth in our abilities, our achievements, our positions, and what people think of us. But there are some real consequences if we listen to the first voice rather than the second voice. And I want to share with you Nowen's own journey of that. This is a passage from his book, The Return of the Prodigal, which my wife spoke about couple of, uh, about a year or two ago. And he says this, at issue here is the question, to whom do I belong? To God or to the world? Many of my daily preoccupations suggest that I belong more to the world than God. A little criticism makes me angry. A little rejection makes me depressed. A little praise raises my spirits and a little success excites me. It takes very little to raise me up or thrust me down. Often I am like a small boat on the ocean, completely at the mercy of its waves. All the time and energy I spend in keeping some kind of balance, preventing myself from being tipped over and drowning, shows that my life is mostly a struggle for survival, not a holy struggle, but an anxious struggle resulting from the mistaken idea that it is the world that defines me. And I wonder if there are many of us here today who feel a little bit like that small boat, tossed around by the weight of other people's opinions and expectations. In Henry's, sorry, in Nowen's books and sermons, you will find other illustrations of what it's like to forget where our value comes from. But this morning, I want to show you an illustration uh, from myself. I want to imagine that this beach ball represents your value, your identity, and where you get that from. Now, we have two choices. To listen to the second voice, which says, rest in the knowledge that you are loved by God. You don't need to prove yourself. You don't need to have lots of things to feel valued. Or you can listen to the first voice, which says, well, your, your value comes from what other people say about you. 
How about you say, you see what other people think? How, how about you put your value in other people's hands? So you do this. And you get tossed around by the weight of people's expectations, thrown around by what they think. And then it comes back to you feeling flat and rolling across the floor. That was supposed to be passed around the entire room, so it didn't really work. We wouldn't have enough people here today. But I hope you get the image that when you have the choice to put your value either in the firm, secure foundation of what God thinks or in other people's hands, you get tossed about. Your life is turbulent. The thing is that once you put your value in other people's hands, it's hard to get back. But there is a second voice that we can listen to that tells us that our worth comes from somewhere else. And it's a voice that we find in here. It's when we see it in Genesis chapter 1 where God creates us in his image and he calls it good. We read it when we read through the drama unfolding in the Old Testament where you can almost hear God's heart break every time his people walk away from him. We read it in the prophet of Isaiah where he talks, he paints the picture of Israel being a child who has left his father and no longer knows his father's voice. We see it in the prophet of Amos where he paints Israel as the lover who has betrayed her husband. We see it in Jesus being now to a cross to forgive the sins of those who have put him there. We are convinced by it, by Paul's letter to the Galatian church when he says, stop trying to prove yourself. Because if anyone is in Christ, he is a child of God, an heir, and has received grace. And it no longer matters if you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're white or black, whether you are slave or free, whether you're a male or female. Nothing matters ahead of the fact that you are loved by God. And finally, we see it in Revelation 21, at the beginning of eternity, where God has raised those in him from the dead. He has restored all of creation so that he can be with his children and they can be with their God. You see, God wants nothing more than to reclaim his children, to be with them again. He loves us and he wants to be with us. And that is the voice we are to listen to. We are more than our abilities, our achievements, our possessions. We are more than what other people think of us, what they say about us. We are valuable because we are loved by God. And how we are valued is not just important for our own sanity, so that we don't feel like a beach ball tossed around a crowd. If we, de- if we derive, you see... The thing about value is that how we value ourselves tends to be how we value others, right? If you derive your significance and your value because of your financial security, are you then tempted to value other people by the same measure? If we value being seen as cool and hip and important, when we go have coffee out there afterwards... Do we then look for the cool and the hip and the important people to sit to over the others? And there are two problems with this. The first is that we are called to live to a higher standard. We are commanded to love one another regardless of what that other person has done or is, whether that is an enemy or a friend. And if you're a Christian, you don't actually get a choice. God doesn't want a society that is divided by the discrimination between rich and poor, between the cool and the uncool, between the important and the unimportant. Let me read to you from James chapter 2, and this is the message version. My dear friends, do not let public opinion influence how you live out our glorious christ oriented faith. If a man enters your church wearing an expensive shirt and a street person wearing rags comes in right after him and you say to the man in the suit, sit here, sir, this is the best seat in the house and either ignore the street person or say, better sit here in the back row. 
Haven't you segregated God's children and proven that you are judges who cannot be trusted? Listen, dear friends, isn't it clear by now that God operates quite differently? He chose the world's down and outs as the kingdom's first citizens with full rights and privileges. This kingdom is promised to anyone who loves God. James goes on, You do well when you complete the royal rule of the scriptures. Love others as yourself. But if you play up to these so-called important people, you go against the rule and stand convicted by it. You can't pick and choose these things, specializing in keeping one or two things in God's law and ignoring the others. The second reason that it is important to consider how we value ourselves and how we value others is that it's rather hard to love people when you value them through human eyes. Who here has often thought, man, why is that person so hard to love? That difficult person in your family, there's a few hands going up. That person in the church congregation that just needs that little extra bit of grace and patience. All those work colleagues. You see, it's hard to love these people, isn't it? I mean, most of us would cook a meal or chop firewood for someone who showers us with praise and affirmation. But, you know, Jesus calls us to love our enemies, to cook a meal or to chop firewood for that bitter, cynical, gossiping person that we know. And that's hard, isn't it? And so many times I have prayed, God, teach me how to love this difficult person in my life. But how did Nowen do it? How did Nowen go from prestigious universities to caring for people who couldn't even read his works or care about websites devoted to him? I think Nowen found his capacity to love others by realizing that he was very much loved himself. And if we too can be anchored in the knowledge that we are deeply loved, and if we can realize that others are loved in the same way, then our capacity to love those difficult people in our lives will increase. And I think slowly we'll realize that it's that bitter, cynical, insecure person that needs that meal or that firewood the most because they are most in need of God's love. Church, we must listen to that second voice, the voice that tells us that we are all the beloved. We are beloved sons and daughters of God. Otherwise, we will not have no hope in fulfilling the commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. As the worship team comes up, I want to leave you with a couple of pieces of advice. The first comes from now on, and that is to pray and meditate. I've realized in my extensive life on earth that inner change does not come Quickly, changing our character, changing our minds, the renewal of our minds is a process. And it takes prayer and it takes meditation and it takes daily, daily thought. For me, it's praying every morning, God, thank you that I am your beloved son. Help me to realize this and help me to see others as your beloved sons and daughters. The second piece of advice is from me. Kill the comparison. If you have the disease of comparison, like me, life is tiring. <laughs> Always comparing yourself how you match up with other people. And I think Theodore Roosevelt put it really well. Comparison is a thief of joy. If we can learn to listen to the first voice, sorry, the second voice, that tells us that we are loved by God, then we can choose to ignore the second voice. She tells us that we must compare, we must compete, and we must prove ourselves. And if we can do that, then we can be God's community that he wants, community of love. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We just ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand the extent to which you love us that we are not loved because of what we've done or what we can do, but we are loved because you have chosen us as your children. 
We ask that this reality would sink in, Father, so that we can love others to the capacity that you call us to. In Jesus' name, amen.